Great. Okay, so welcome back, everybody. Um, uh, I hope everybody is doing well. Uh, I'd, it's my pleasure now to introduce our next speaker, uh, Professor uh, Natalia Alexun, and uh, let me tell you a little bit about her. Um, professor Alexun is Professor of Modern Jewish History at the Graduate School of Turo College. She is an historian of East European Jewish history and the Holocaust. She's the author of Where to? The Zionist Movement in Poland, 1944 to 1950, and the co-editor of the 20th and 29th volumes of the scholarly journal Pauline. Her critical edition of, of Gersh and Taffet's Destruction of, of Zhulkov Jews was published in 2019. Her most recent book is Conscious History, Polish Jewish Historians Before the Holocaust, which was published by the Littman Library in 2021. She is currently working on a book about the so-called cadaver affair at the European universities in the 1920s and 30s, and on a project dealing with the daily lives of Jews in hiding in Galicia during the Holocaust. And I would just like to say, uh, on a more personal note, that we are delighted, uh, Professor Alexson, that you're joining us today. Uh, I've been myself very fortunate to be able to learn a lot from you, and um, thank you for being here. And vice versa, Paul. Thank you so much for having me, and thank you, Liz. And um, I'm I'm thrilled to be with you. I I do wish I could see your faces, and now I'm going to share PowerPoint and effectively uh, uh, not be able to uh, see those of you who are on camera. But uh, hopefully, uh, in the coming months, we'll be seeing uh, one another in such. Uh, um, occasions um, in the flesh. So um, I will talk today, uh, going back chronologically from what we just heard uh, from uh, Professor Casso, uh, going chronologically to the interwar uh, uh, period. Uh, but I think it matters also because it shows a great deal of um, continuities uh, in the efforts of um, uh, Jewish communities um, and Jewish physicians in particular, uh, trying to protect and, and, and save as many, um, as many Jews in the ghettos and in other settings will learn about these different settings in the course of, of the seminar. Uh, but I will today talk about uh, primarily uh, the 20 years between the First World War and the Second World War, but also touch a little bit on the um, early uh, stages of building uh, institutions that were Jewish uh, uh, healthcare institutions in Poland. Um, so of course, uh, this is a, a matter that has deep historical roots in a variety of uh, Jewish autonomous um, institutions uh, in um, various communities where those communities were setting up places and setting up health uh, help uh, and healthcare uh, for, uh, for Jews uh, in need. Um, and so this does not, the story does not start uh, in 1918. In fact, it continues and many of the institutions that I will um, me mention since we only have 60 minutes and I would love to hear from you as well. Uh, they do start actually uh, earlier, but we are talking about a network of institutions and network of people, a network of uh, medical resources, and I would say ambitions or visions about how um, the largest Jewish community in Europe, uh, over three and a half million uh, Jewish men, women, and children, how they were going to promote and protect health for, for the future. And so just to, to, to jump ahead, some of the big uh, uh, points of this ambition, of this vision, uh, was actually uh, taking care and protecting the youngest generation. Uh, children, Jewish children were without a doubt at the very heart of many of these um, local 
and uh, national Jewish initiatives. But in general, as you can see here, we talk, we're talking about uh, a great number of uh, individual hospitals, uh, many of them like the little picture you see uh, on the right side, uh, private foundations funded with uh, resources uh, given by local, uh, local Jewish uh, communal activists, uh, men and women uh, who created and expanded local Jewish hospitals. We're talking about private practice of Jewish physicians, and this is particularly important. I'll come back to it, why uh, uh, so many Jews um, were in private practice and in some fields of medicine more so than in others. It's also a question of how do you train the young the young new generation of Jewish physicians over those 20 years, and a broader ambition of um, associations to which Jewish physicians belong on two levels, one on a Jewish level, and this is the Oze and Toz associations, uh, the, um, the Toz in particular, which was founded, as you can see here in 1921, uh, shortly after uh, the First World War, and, and wars that continued uh, uh, for uh, two, uh, three years, um, about the borders of the new Polish uh, state, uh, re resurrected, reconstructed Polish state, um, but also they belong to general associations of physicians, such as this uh, association of the physicians of the Polish uh, Republic, um, until they were no longer able to in 1937, I will mention it earlier. There is also a matter of intellectual um, uh, wealth, of uh, initiatives, journals, publications, research. And again, we'll see some degree of, in Yiddish and in Polish, um, we'll see a degree of it uh, continued uh, in the ghettos, in particular in the Warsaw ghetto uh, in the early years of the occupation. So uh, first this general association creating a network which to some extent was a shared network of physician. This is an organization that functioned as a, a union of, uh, of uh, physicians, bringing together those that work in hospitals, in schools, that were radiologists, and that were engaged in public health. You see some of the centers, uh, uh, 6,300 members in all those branches related to some of the largest uh, cities uh, in Poland, many of them with Jewish population of 50% and more. Uh, so you can imagine that the membership was heavily tilted, heavily Jewish, especially in those cities such as Baranowicz, uh, Białystok, Brześć, Grodno, but also uh, in others. And I'll come back to, to the statistics in a moment. And then there is a network that is specifically created uh, by Jewish physicians, but also Jewish intelligentsia, lawyers, public figures in the uh, a Russian imperial context before the First World War, but it continued to be active, especially in the eastern part of Poland under its name Oze, and then the organization that I mentioned earlier, the 1921 uh, TOS, uh, the Association for the Protection of the Health of Jewish population. And as uh, you can see in this PowerPoint, it was particularly concerned, especially in the early years of its existence, uh, with battling contagious diseases. Uh, we all have been reminded uh, with the uh, Spanish flu epidemics uh, after, uh, after World War I. Um, and so this was one of the epidemics, but there were other dangerous contagious diseases and TOS was uh, very much engaged in creating network, to some extent a mobile network, uh, but also fighting diseases that were seen as a result of poverty, of terrible uh, sanitary conditions in which uh, many Jews, including Jewish refugees in uh, Polish uh, cities, lived uh, conditions of uh, uh, 
orphanages for um, hundreds of Jewish orphans. Uh, and so they were uh, from the uh, first moment engaged in those uh, battles. And we see a dramatic growth of uh, those uh, over the period that I'm going to talk about today. Uh, we have 17 institutions in 1922, uh, so a year after it was officially uh, founded, and on the eve of the Second World War in 1939, TOS has 368 clinics uh, of various kinds uh, in 72 towns. Now, uh, they employ some uh, 1,000 uh, or so Jewish physicians and nurses and, and staff. Uh, so we're talking about an extremely impressive network, again, of, of institutions, uh, of know-how, uh, and of, um, of physicians themselves. And uh, just to keep in mind, especially in the 1930s, we're talking about uh, a community that is facing great uh, um, uh, economic difficulties and increased uh, state uh, anti-Semitism. So building and maintaining of this uh, network uh, was uh, particularly challenging. And here we go back to the joint that uh, Professor Casso just discussed, uh, which had a great deal to do with the success of TOS in uh, expanding and maintaining uh, all those clinics. It is also a paid membership that was uh, responsible for the budget. So people were actively engaged, uh, not only uh, uh, some of them volunteering, especially the uh, well-established uh, um, uh, doctors who worked uh, without uh, being um, paid, but also people were uh, very much engaged by paying this membership so that those institutions could provide pretty much free of charge services to, uh, to Jews that, again, in the conditions of uh, a Great Depression and, and anti-Semitic um, uh, legislations uh, were facing uh, uh, great uh, distress. So this is one aspect of the growth that is really um, um, all Poland wide, although it is particularly uh, um, strong in uh, central and eastern Poland, where the density of the Jewish population was the highest. Uh, but just to go back to the sort of um, uh, from from the um, physicians' point of view, uh, engagement of Jewish physicians in creating those institutions. Uh, before TOS, when it was happening as per city, per needs of local community. And we see in just one case of, of Warsaw, how the activities on behalf of the community and activities on behalf of the health of Jewish communities come together. Uh, so one of the leading doctors uh, and as you can see here, the chief doctor of the Jewish hospital um, in Warsaw, created in a Chista district. It is now a um, different district, but the name was retained for many years of the hospital's existence, uh, was at the same time engaged in uh, various medical associations. In fact, he was a founder of many of the general Polish associations in Warsaw, but also in uh, communal activities on behalf of public health in general. Uh, and here is one of the interwar pictures of the Chiste Hospital. This is, of course, an official uh, photograph uh, in which everything is beautifully arranged, but you can see the kind of pride that the community takes 
in having and maintaining one of the most modern and advanced hospitals in all of Poland. As you can see here, some of the information on the hospital in just the, which will during the Holocaust play a very important role in a Warsaw ghetto. We have all these uh, words, surgical, gynecolog gynecological, venereal diseases, pulmonary, uh, and they are, many of them, them, especially the neurological one uh, and gynecological one, they are cutting edge research institutions as well, uh, where uh, truly uh, the staff is pushing uh, the, the scholarship and the tools and the, the methods of uh, treating uh, various uh, diseases. Um, and it is an explicitly Jewish institution with a synagogue uh, um, serving uh, the community um, with the involvement, again, as I mentioned, of some of these men, at this point, these are all men, uh, physicians who are actively uh, um, founding uh, journals that continue to exist today, that are founding associations, uh, medical associations that are engaged in uh, pan-European uh, medical discourse, but also work on behalf of uh, their Jewish uh, patients. And we have some of those visuals uh, just giving us glimpses uh, uh, into the experiences of not just uh, doctors, but also those that they, uh, that they had treated. And again, if you look at the statistics before 1939, the Chiste Hospital in Warsaw has some 1500 beds. Uh, it's attended by 147 doctors and um, uh, 119 nurses, et cetera, et cetera. This is also important because it can serve as a place in which young Jewish graduates of medical uh, departments can get their internship, can get their practical training, which is becoming increasingly difficult in the 1930s especially. And they basically, unless they find a place in a Jewish hospital, their medical diploma is useless because they cannot continue with the training. Uh, I mentioned the cutting edge uh, research and uh, I want to give you just a, a couple of examples of these um, uh, physicians and scholars uh, and communal activists. Uh, one is Dr. Samuel Goldflam, uh, who was uh, actively involved in creating, fun, founding uh, and creating Zofiówka, uh, um, a very novel, modern clinic for mentally ill uh, patients that was opened in Otwotsk uh, near Warsaw. Um, he was involved in creating and maintaining the uh, children's Jewish Children's Hospital uh, in Warsaw. Uh, and um, uh, in uh, Otwotsk itself, you can see also multiple um, organizations, Jewish organizations such as Marpe, Brius, uh, in which uh, uh, which um, work uh, with uh, um, upper middle class Jews to fund and create uh, conditions uh, for, for um, Jews in need of, for example, sanatorium. Otwotsk has a very advantageous, or used to have a very adv advantageous uh, microclimate, and it was thought to be uh, very good for uh, those in danger of, co um, of contagious diseases, in particular tuberculosis, but also, as I mentioned, for um, mentally uh, ill. You see here the picture as it was a uh, functioning of Zofiówka. Uh, by the way, uh, the name came from the name of a woman, Zofia Endelman, who donated all her jewelry uh, so that the um, uh, piece of land where the hospital was erected uh, was purchased. So it was named after her. And the picture on the right is actually 
quite recent, this is the current state, uh, rather sad state of uh, these buildings. And it has a fascinating, tragic, fascinating story uh, during the Holocaust, but I won't go there uh, today. Another uh, leading doctor connected with uh, just a hospital, but also connected with uh, neurology as a new developing field uh, was Dr. Edward Flatow. He and Goldflam were actually close friends. And you see some of his, um, at the time, novel uh, research. Uh, he uh, created, uh, created an atlas of brain. He studied migraines. Uh, and uh, was in general interested in both um, clinical work, uh, but also in promoting uh, health um, among Jews uh, more broadly. Um, he also trained a whole generation of Jewish uh, neurologists. And here you have just one um, sort of citation from one of his students about uh, Flatow's particularly uh, loving and, and, and caring relationship with his students and how he really uh, um, cherished and promoted uh, their um, medical education as he headed the Department of Neurological Disease uh, at the Chiste Hospital. But if we were to look closer, we truly find in each and every uh, Polish town, uh, physicians that are the backbone of local communities. And I think Tzemach Shabbat from Vilna is a perfect example of someone who is on the one hand uh, closely uh, involved in uh, medical, uh, uh, in his medical profession. He has a private practice and he's particularly interested in fertility um, uh, of his uh, patients, um, also in promoting, um, again, healthy pregnancies, in particular among Jewish women who are the majority of his patients. Um, but he's also involved in um, organizing um, summer camps, uh, in communal affairs, uh, in education, access to, uh, to uh, cultural activities for, uh, for, for Jewish uh, ch children and adolescents. So there is a whole range of activities um, and he's one of the founders of Volksgesund, Yiddish language, popular uh, public health uh, journal, uh, which very um, closely discussed such matters as uh, good nutrition, uh, hygiene, how uh, one should uh, raise uh, the young, uh, healthy generation of, uh, of Polish Jews. Um, and yet another example, and uh, Milejkowski is one example that has a direct continuity into the uh, Holocaust period, uh, a, a physician who was um, closely uh, working with Toz uh, in, um, in Warsaw. He was working at the Chiste Hospital. And then in, uh, in a Warsaw ghetto, he will be the head of public health department uh, in a Judenrat um, and also will be involved in the study of uh, hunger. Uh, but we will probably not go into it uh, today. And, and just to give you a a, a snapshot, a, a, a sense of how uh, central uh, hospitals and those Jewish physicians uh, staffing, uh, staffing these institutions are for individual communities, you can see that they really serve as sort of uh, vignettes of, of a community, uh, a postcard of communities uh, uh, displayed again with great pride. Uh, and they are uh, always uh, institutions created by the Jewish mi mi minority uh, with the funding that is collected from those uh, who can uh, donate for that cause uh, and treating uh, a broad range of uh, patients from all walks of 
of life uh, on the on the so-called Jewish street. So you have here such postcards from Lvov, Lviv, Lemberg. Uh, the building is actually a hospital still today. You can see uh, some remnants of a of a Jewish uh, um, decorations, stars of David, and, and such. Uh, here is um, uh, Wood. Um, we just heard about, uh, but also smaller towns, uh, 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 well, this is an interesting case in and of itself, uh, the children's hospital in, in Warsaw that uh, continued to function uh, from 1878 until 1942. So you can see the, the degree of communal investment um, and how truly generations of Jewish physicians uh, practiced there and, and uh, treated uh, patients. Uh, and again, um, here is a post-war picture, I think, uh, of, uh, of Przemysl uh, Hospital, Lublin, etc., etc. If we were to look at um, memorial books from individual Jewish communities, often they feature uh, um, uh, photographs and memories about uh, Jewish hospitals. I mentioned the prominence of, uh, of Jews among uh, physicians, and this is something that is very important to understand uh, for, uh, for the broader context in which Jewish physicians uh, um, practice. Uh, so uh, in 1931, some 46% of all physicians in a second Polish Republic uh, are uh, Jews. Um, to remind you, uh, Jews are 10% of the general population. So this is four times more uh, than uh, the, the percentage of, of Jews in a general population. But if we look more closely, uh, especially in, um, in uh, large cities uh, or cities in general, uh, such as Warsaw, such as Łódź, um, the numbers are truly staggering. 66% um, in Warsaw, 80 plus percent in Łódź, 70% in Lwów, and also in some uh, more rural areas, um, the numbers are very high. I'm interested in particular in uh, Eastern uh, Poland and in particular in Eastern Galicia, the area that was actually not part of the Russian Empire until World War I, but rather part of Austro-Hungary. So it's a slightly different story than say uh, Warsaw um, uh, medical milieu. They had a different point of reference uh, and they went usually to study medicine in Vienna rather than um, in Moscow. Uh, but, um, if, you, if we look at, at Eastern Galicia, uh, you can see very clearly that many, uh, uh, many patients um, in, uh, in um, Polish and Ukrainian uh, uh, um, towns and, and villages in particular uh, would be treated by, by Jewish physicians. And I'll come back to it on Wednesday when I talk about a little bit about post-war uh, rebuilding of a Jewish uh, network of medical um, institutions because it's connected to the experiences uh, during the war. Um, Jewish institutions, uh, rather Jewish uh, physicians, of course, had these private practices where they so uh, Jewish and non-Jewish patients, but they were also uh, trained and hired by TOS. And in fact, TOS as an association was the best bet for, uh, for Jewish physicians to practice uh, medicine. You see here a competition announcement about a position in a Jewish hospital in Wokowisk, this is Eastern Poland, and the conditions that one need to meet to uh, submit applications, citizenship, medical diploma, uh, three years of practice, 
um, um, and uh, handwritten uh, curriculum vitae, uh, quite, um, um, I'm quite sure that there were a, a great deal of applications for this and other such announcements, although, of course, uh, uh, many physicians were hoping to uh, receive their uh, appointments in largest cities, and the smaller the places, uh, the uh, the less attractive they tended to be, uh, which is also why uh, so many uh, Jewish uh, physicians practice there um, as opposed to uh, non-Jewish ones. Um, here you have just a taste of the kind of promotional uh, publications uh, of TOS about their work, about their activities. And, and as I mentioned, they had achieved a great deal over 20 years of uh, their existence. They were promoting um, hygiene and proper nutrition for infants and children, and they were particularly interested, and let me just show you some of this uh, material. Uh, here uh, is a poster about nursing. Um, they were particularly uh, interested uh, or, or focused on fighting or decreasing infant mortality. And we have data that suggests that they were very successful. Uh, so for example, in 1929, uh, the infant mortality in Warsaw among newborns who were Jewish newborns was about six among 100. But if you looked at non-Jewish new, uh, non -Jewish newborns, there were 12. So uh, Jewish newborns had twice the chance to, uh, to survive uh, and not die uh, in comparison. Um, TOS was also uh, very much involved in organizing uh, medical help, uh, medical assistance to school, uh, schools and, um, and having uh, children in Jewish schools uh, looked at and, and treated. This was particularly important because for many uh, families, uh, this would be the only way to have their children uh, treated or vaccinated, among other things. Uh, TOS had a whole uh, campaign uh, pertaining to vaccinations, especially uh, smallpox vaccinations. Um, it also, uh, because of its concern for uh, proper nutrition and awareness of how many Jewish children from the poorer families were not getting proper nutrition. They were also trying to distribute food rations and uh, among children using especially school as a way to do so. Uh, again, this sounds very familiar after last, uh, last year. And they did so for about 36,000 uh, children, needy children uh, in uh, Polish towns. Uh, we can imagine that in the late 30s, this was probably drop uh, a drop in the ocean of needs. Nevertheless, they were able to help uh, um, across across uh, uh, the country in uh, multiple communities in some 70 uh, towns. They also organized uh, summer camps. Oh, here you have a, a infant care clinic. And if you're familiar with the Israeli um, 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 network of Tipat Halaf, of, of uh, clinics where uh, young mothers could receive uh, advice on uh, childcare uh, um, and proper, uh, proper care of their newborns, this is very much build on the model that was created by TOS uh, in uh, interwar uh, Poland. So you could wait your child, the child was um, checked regularly, you received advice on uh, how to uh, better uh, do this. And, and again, this issue of hygiene, uh, given the conditions in which many families lived, was seen as very important. Now we can discuss it to what extent, um, you know, uh, families that uh, could barely 
uh, um, manage financially again, especially in the 1930s, uh, they were in need to be told that hygiene is important and to what extent they were simply uh, unable to, to meet those standards. Nevertheless, Toss believed that um, informing, educating, uh, especially parents, especially mothers actually, was quite crucial. And all of this was really with a view that the community, despite all the difficulties, despite uh, increasing violence and exclusion and, um, and uh, great economic uh, difficulties, that the community needed to make sure that it is raising a healthy uh, generation of young uh, uh, Polish uh, Jews. So physicians would meet regularly, would publish, would discuss how these things uh, can and should be done, again, with the assistance of, uh, of those that were donating their time and expertise and money, and also with great deal of involvement of uh, joint. And uh, connected to that uh, concern with the health of the young generation was also a campaign pertaining to venereal disease. Uh, here is a, um, again an instructive material how if you are sick with syphilis and other uh, uh, venereal diseases you need to go and see a doctor because it will have otherwise uh, uh, gra grave consequences, not only for you, uh, the men, but also for, for your family. And this is ultimately uh, a, a necessity for the community as such. Um, another great danger for this young generation that was being raised was tuberculosis. And uh, Taos has uh, made um, efforts to organize uh, TB clinics where, again, as you can see, uh, you could get advice, you could be checked, uh, you could be kept up uh, with the health of yourself and your children. Uh, some of this checking, again, was uh, happening through uh, Jewish schools. And Taz followed very closely on the hygiene and health of Jewish uh, school children. Now, of course, we look at this and at all this data, and we know uh, what is in store for this generation of Jewish children, right? Especially in the 30s. Um, but they are, of course, working with the idea that they need to um, fight skin disease and cavities and tuberculosis and, and all kinds of uh, uh, dangerous, uh, dangerous to the uh, health of uh, young, uh, young Jewish uh, boys and, and girls. So again, a great deal of um, um, institutional know-how has been put into organizing it and organizing it in a way that uh, uh, not only children from the better off families could take advantage of it. Uh, so there is that effort to self-finance uh, uh, for a um, wide range of, uh, of um, children to attend. Um, and I mentioned earlier uh, summer camps, uh, something that very, very, very few parents could potentially afford for their children. So Taz is making an effort, again, all across uh, Polish uh, towns and Stetlech to uh, organize uh, for poor uh, school children summer camps to attend. This was also something that was seen as as a, a way to fight uh, tuberculosis before these children were in direct danger of contracting it, making sure that they can have those sun baths, that they can uh, breathe fresh air, that they can be in a forest, in a pine forest, uh, that they can rest from the uh, harsh conditions in which they uh, often lived 
and often worked helping their parents um, during the school year. And there is fantastically uh, interesting material, especially at, uh, at EVO in New York, uh, material created by children who attended these, um, these summer camps. Uh, here, an album, uh, many photographs, uh, activities photographed, uh, and also, as you can see, visits here by communal leaders who, um, for whom this was seen as a priority. Um, of course, there is also an aspect of this public health that is connected to better off uh, uh, Jewish families and um, a culture of going to spas, uh, um, uh, places where you could um, improve your health, uh, drink mineral waters, uh, walk, uh, breathe fresh air. Uh, here's just one of those popular uh, sites in the uh, um, interwar period, Truskaviets. But I think that uh, we, we need to see those also in connection to, again, communal efforts of organizing um, uh, healthcare for uh, other uh, other Jewish families uh, um, in um, in Poland, um, there is also a great deal of research that tries to tackle uh, the specific health challenges to the Jews, and uh, you might. Uh, be familiar with it, but originally diabetes, for example, in in the German context was called Jewish disease because it was so prevalent among uh, Jewish patients. And so Jewish physicians working in all those Jewish hospitals that some of which have a research uh, uh, agenda very much as part of their mission uh, do uh, use this opportunity to study and look at uh, here on the left uh, side is an article about specific issues of diabetes among Jews. There is research about uh, cancer uh, among Jewish women, especially ovarian cancer, about schizophrenia. Uh, so this is also looking forward in the sense of um, recognizing how to have a sense of um, uh, dangers uh, that uh, Jews uh, might be facing as, as a group. Um, I mentioned, and I'm looking at the time, um, I want to make sure that we, we do have time, uh, time left, but I want to mention also a, f uh, a few words about training physicians, because of course, when we have 46% of the physicians being Jewish in 1931, this is a result of an ongoing presence of Jew Jewish uh, students in medical schools, especially in Poland, but then increasing increasingly abroad. And you can see here how these numbers in terms of medicine are going down from uh, 1920s from 30% uh, percent to uh, um, increasingly less so uh, in the 30s and on the eve of the Second uh, World War. And this does not happen uh, because of uh, the fact that Jews um, lost interest in medicine. Medicine is seen by many as one of the few open avenues for upward mobility because they can practice uh, in private uh, practice, because they can uh, receive training in Jewish hospitals. Uh, it is a result of numerus clausus of quota systems that is being um, introduced at Polish universities, uh, especially in the second half of the 20s and, and throughout the 30s. And here's one of the protests in the Jewish newspaper of Kraków. Some of the faculty in Polish medical schools are explicit about the fact that uh, Jews should be barred from entering medical schools or should be limited uh, at, at most to the percentage uh, that they are in the country. Uh, so far less 
than the percentage that Jewish students were coming into these medical schools. Um, and you'll see here uh, one of my favorite actually drawings from a, a student uh, a newspaper presenting a sort of a, a, a Polish non-Jewish uh, student wearing a student cap defending uh, the door leading to university from all these Jews that you can see on the right side, uh, all uh, drawn in a very stereotypical way. Some of them dressed traditionally, some of them not. But uh, the, the uh, statement uh, under it is uh, um, fight for numerous clauses uh, and uh, away from our uh, universities. And although this is not specifically here about medical schools, it is in particular about access to medical schools. And so Jewish students are barred from associations of uh, students of medicine. They create their own association of Jewish medical students at various universities. Here you see Moshek Privis ID. He was to become one of the founders of medical school uh, at Beersheba University. He studied and completed, graduated from a medical department in Warsaw, uh, but faced a, a great deal of difficulties uh, including the question of dissections, but um, I will uh, hopefully uh, um, have another chance to tell you about it. So as the numerous clauses becomes more and more problematic and violence at universities becomes more and more pre prevalent, uh, Jewish, uh, Polish Jews, men and women are leaving uh, Poland in order to study uh, medicine. And you see here some of the options. The options are Czechoslovakia, Hungary has an even earlier numerous clauses, so that's not a possibility. But until Hitler's rise to power, Germany and Italy and France are the most um, um, popular destinations where Polish Jews uh, go to uh, study uh, medicine. And here, just one example of someone who um, enrolled at the university in Vienna, uh, but was born, as you can see, in Poland, in Poland uh, and, um, and came uh, to pursue medical, uh, medical career. This exclusion is not only um, about excluding medical students, uh, which if complete, would lead to a uh, medical profession uh, basically becoming a non-Jewish profession, but also excluding Jewish uh, physicians from these associations that often uh, Jews had helped to uh, organize. So uh, the most um, clear cut case is the case of uh, Association of Physicians of uh, Polish State, um, which passed Aryan, the so-called Aryan paragraphs in 1937, uh, that meant that you have to not only not be Jewish, uh, i.e. a practicing Jew member of a Jewish community, um, uh, but your parents needed to be Christian. Uh, so this was uh, already taking it into uh, one step uh, earlier, of um, ensuring uh, that uh, the candidates, the Jewish, that the physicians were not Jews. Um, and you see here, so he, see here uh, just one example of a local newspaper, uh, in this case from Częstochowa, Częstochow in, in Yiddish, uh, calling for or repeating the call of the association for purging uh, the medical profession uh, from Jews calling uh, calling uh, Jews uh, you know, as elements without connection to Polish nation, culture, and spirit, uh, and and calling for a profession that would really be a, a jumping board for upward mobility for ethnic Poles, uh, Christian Poles, but really Christian for quite uh, several generations. Uh, so. Uh, we see uh, throughout the interwar period, on the one hand, a great uh, a level of, of achievements 
uh, of Jewish community in organizing self-help, uh, in organizing public health, uh, in um, setting the goals uh, for uh, Jewish physicians uh, to care for uh, the Jewish uh, population um, and also treat other patients, but that's for maybe another discussion. Uh, but we also see how this uh, vision is becoming increasingly difficult uh, in terms of both uh, medical practice and educating uh, a new generation of uh, physicians. Uh, by the way, in the interwar Poland, and especially in the 1930s, there is an increasing number of women who are entering this profession and becoming quite uh, quite uh, important uh, um, and well the the specialties uh, um, are often connected to either uh, gynecology or uh, or pa pediatrics uh, but this is uh, one of the new and exciting phenomena uh, of the period I'll stop here uh, because I really would love to have questions and comments from you thank you very much uh, thank you, thank you, uh, Professor Alexun. I know that both Liz and I uh, have received questions. So, um, but first of all, let me just thank you for a great presentation, and um, it's very exciting to to learn about these physicians and the healthcare, the organizations. Um, uh, and just uh, before I, uh, I know before I turn open up the questions. I'm just a little bit, I was a little bit unclear about the difference between Taz and Oze, because I know a lot of the posters that you had were from Oze, and maybe you could just clarify the, those for us. Yeah, it, 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 it is, uh, it can be easily um, confusing. They are in a, they are the same organization, meaning Oze starts as a all Russia uh, organization and part of post-war Poland um, was part of the Russian Empire. So in these parts of Poland, especially Vilna, uh, eastern, northeastern parts of uh, Second Polish Republic, TOS continues to function as OZE under that earlier Russian uh, Russian name, uh, but this is part of the All Poland network now of organizations. Um, and OZE uh, uh, is not uh, functioning only in Poland, they have also their outposts in, in Germany and in France. So this is a, a broader, you can say, transnational Jewish uh, 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 public health uh, movement. But specifically in Poland, they get translated as TOS. Uh, so, um, so there is a sort of duality in naming, but it's part of the history of the partitioned Poland and then the new new state. But thank you, Paul, for this question because I, I, I think it is important to clarify. Oh, thank you. I, I know Liz has some questions and I have more questions, but I'll, I'll, I'll turn it over to Liz. Oh, thank you. Um, thank you, Professor. That was wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, there's a question from a teacher that goes a little beyond the scope. It's not, it, it sort of moves from interwar to uh, the rise of uh, the Nazis. Um, the question is, you sh had so many wonderful artifacts showing records, you know, very detailed records of medical care. And the teacher wondered whether these records were then later seized and used against the Jewish communities in Poland by German authorities to identify and locate mm -hmm. Jews, as well as for propaganda. That's, this is a great question. So um, to the best of my knowledge, no. Um, um, the the situation was uh, not difficult with uh, locating and identifying uh, because uh, there were um, communal records other uh, other kinds i should mention that uh, legally speaking uh, you were automatically a member of the kehila of the gemeinde of the jewish community if you were born to jewish parents and you had to take active steps to to step out and so even uh, those jews who were 
uh, de facto not practicing or considered themselves atheists or considered themselves atheists ideologically, for example, they were uh, communists, uh, they were members of the community, they, they, they were married by rabbis, uh, um, so they were all in those records. Uh, the, the question of identification, um, sort of going after, uh, right, um, it has more to do with uh, a much, much smaller number of uh, Jews who were um, converted, uh, those who were converted and those who were um, in mar married to, to non-Jews and who as such uh, stepped again, uh, left the community. Um, you could have a civil uh, marriage in, in interwar Poland, but there were only uh, certain locations where uh, that was possible. And again, um, too much uh, complications of, of political history of 19th century partitions to go into it. But so, so, um, so there were extensive communal records, and then uh, the um, converted and intermarried, quote unquote, uh, individuals that very often depended on um, on the goodwill of um, of neighbors, right? Especially if your Jewishness or your the Jewishness of your parents was not common knowledge. Um, it could be that the authorities wouldn't know that in their eyes you qualified as, as a Jew. And so we have stories of individuals who don't go to the ghetto when the order is issued for various uh, um, localities and who live outside throughout the war and those that they are reported by neighbors as Jews. But it doesn't have to do with with the artifacts I showed. And thank you for um, for your kind words. Thank you. So, um, uh, a, a number of questions here um, that I have. Uh, I guess one is um, let me read you, and you'll do the questions, and you'll decide what you want to answer. Um, one is how did the Polish community at large respond to these Jewish institutions? Uh, did um, where did they get their supplies and their funding? And did the Polish government help or hinder uh, these hospitals and other organizations? This is this is the first question is fantastic, and I wish I could say more. Uh, I think this is something that hasn't really been studied. Um, I'm not sure it can be studied, but I, I think that there is so much uh, interwar press and memoirs that one could at least try. Um, my sense, but based on, on um, intuition, um, so do not quote me on this, uh, my sense is that it could easily be a function of a degree of jealousy. Um, and uh, we see this uh, with regard to German Jewish uh, hospitals, uh, that um, the demographics there is very different. So, for example, in Breslau, uh, the uh, illustrious, um, modern, large uh, hospital that has been built by the Jewish Gemeinde, by the Jewish community, by definition, is seeing non Jewish patients. And in, at some point, they are becoming. Uh, a very, very large proportion of patients, and, and not talking about the forced Aryanization, quote unquote, as it were. Um, I don't think that TOS hospitals are facing that kind of difficulty or challenge with Christian patients um, storming uh, those doors, but I don't doubt that they have a name of you know, better institutions um, or well-staffed, well-equipped institutions. The money, as I say, as I said, come from three sources. It's local fundraising in communities, uh, you know, wealthy businessmen uh, who want to um, donate uh, in, in the name of their wives, in the name of their parents, the patterns that we that continue to, to function in, in Jewish communities worldwide, uh, JDC and, and broader fundraising among those uh, members. 
Uh, but I do think it's remarkable how much this institution manages to achieve in increasingly uh, difficult times. I also want to mention, uh, because this is something I'm very interested in and it's connected to the first question, um, there is a degree of a discourse that has to do with um, discomfort about going to Jewish doctors. And I've seen articles in the press that try to discourage uh, non-Jewish patients from visiting Jewish doctors and how Jewish doctors uh, can't really understand Christians uh, um, or would not, would not, not necessarily be on the same moral um, uh, level. Um, but to my mind, when such articles are repeatedly published, what it means to a historian is that they were unsuccessful in driving this message. And that in fact, uh, patients continued uh, to go to Jewish doctors, partially because in those smaller places, they might have not have other doctors, but also because they thought that these were better doctors. Um, and for my own work on hiding, uh, in Eastern Galicia. In fact, I have multiple stories of Jewish physicians who are offered help uh, and hiding places by their former uh, patients that they were um, able to save. And in fact, the most common is uh, poor peasants whose wife uh, in, in labor, uh, these doctors treated for free and saved their lives. And so then those men offer the, the physicians a hiding place because they they feel morally obligated uh, to pay back. Um, so there is certainly that phenomenon as well. Uh, thank you, thank you so much. Um, uh, Professor Alexson, we have a few more questions, but I think it's no time, time to break. For, it's time to break for lunch and today we have a pretty short lunch break. So, um, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm happy to, if, if, if someone uh, uh, wants, I'm happy to answer emails. And so Paul and Liz, you are absolutely uh, free to share my, my uh, email. Thank, Thank you so, for that generous offer. Thank you. So those people who submitted questions in the chat and for whom we were not able to pose the question, please email either Liz or myself and we will forward your email to uh, uh, Professor uh, Alex soon. Um, Thank you for really a great presentation. Um, it was wonderful. And um, I learned a lot. I think everybody else did as well.